Welcome to everybody who is present in the room and to the many people who are attending us online today. My name is Isabella Atanasiu. I am a new fellow at the Robert Schumann Center at, uh, hosted by the Migration Policy Center during this academic uh, year. And I am going to chair the session today, stepping in the shoes of my colleague Carlota, who had uh, an impediment and he could not uh, join us today. Uh, we are going to uh, listen today to a presentation of work that has obviously raised a lot of interest, as we can see from the attendance. Uh, we have uh, today the pleasure to hear from uh, Max Weber fellow uh, Hirotaka. He is a political scientist uh, doing comparative uh, research on the politics and political economy of immigration and refugee reception. He holds a PhD uh, from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. And during his stay uh, as a Max Weber at the UI, he is uh, working in particular on cross-national variations in host states policies regulating the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. Without further ado, I would like to pass the, the word to our speaker today. Uh, sorry, I just wanted, I forgot to make a few organizational uh, remarks. For people who uh, are in the room, uh, if you want to intervene after the presentation, please use the microphone. For the colleagues online, you have the possibility to uh, put questions in the chat uh, during the presentation and afterwards, or you can raise a hand and we are going to give you the possibility to intervene. Uh, this is all that I wanted to say in terms of uh, organization and coming back to the speaker. Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you to Isabella for the kind introduction and thank you to everyone for coming today. So I'm very excited to present my work here. <clears throat> Sorry. So my talk today is basically the, about the cross-national variation of the refugee hosting policy with a particular focus on the so-called the global south or developing countries. So uh, this is based on one paper coming out of my dissertation research, which I conducted from 2018 until the last month, so just finished in Geneva. But so in this talk, I'm going to present the core theoretical and empirical implication of my dissertation work and specifically focusing on the observed cross-national variation of the <laughs> 50 hosting policy basic country in the so-called the developing world. So the, the title of my presentation is basically the, my core research question. But so I just like to start with the background of this project. So the starting point is a broad observation that uh, different countries treat refugees in very different manners. So here I put the four different photographs from uh, different locations, all of which I took uh, during my previous field trips, mostly in Middle East and the South on Southeast Asia. So basically the photo on the left hand side is basically about the refugee camps, one from the Azraq in Jordan and the one from the uh, Damak is the Eastern Nepal. So it's uh, both is a crowd refugee camp, but very different condition. And the uh, photograph from the right hand side is both kind of the self settlement area of the refugee in the uh, border close to the uh, visual lifting uh, in the country. So, so here, <clears throat> what I want to highlight here is in some countries, the refugees are forced to live in remote camps and their access to a set of social and economic rights are pretty much restricted. But uh, on the other extreme is the refugees are allowed to live as a normal human being. So they're not necessarily the complete freedom. They cannot necessarily enjoy complete freedom, but mostly uh, their access uh, pretty much less restricted. So the important point here is uh, there is a variation on the uh, host country policy on refugees. Uh, so in some countries, I put a very severe restriction. And the, on the other hand, is that some country can kind of let the refugee uh, freely live in their uh, distinction places. So my interest is basically the why this uh, variation is happen. And uh, obviously this variation uh, happen in various different stages. So every individual has a different 
access to the these sites and the, this variation can be found either the across country and also the within country so across different locations where they move their access to their uh, set of social and economic rights is pretty much restricted in very different manner and also uh, there are so many different characteristics that determine this variation but in any case is the focus of my research at least in this project is uh, strictly on the cross national variation of the uh host country policy on refugees so so the key objective is basically to understand and uh, explain this variation in a better manner is the goal of my project mm -hmm. so but <clears throat> In the broader dissertation project, so I did a number of different things. So to address this question, basically, uh, first thing is I did is uh, basically the document cross-national variation using a kind of the original data I constructed during my uh, during my PhD research. So uh, compile the new uh, cross kind of cross-country or multi-country data set about the uh, mostly the refugees' access to the, a certain a defined set of the social economic rights. So creating a new data set is uh, uh, one objective of my project. And using this data is basically I uh, develop one theoretical framework to explain the variation uh, of uh, my project. It's kind of the core theoretical insight, which I will expand on a little bit uh, later on my presentation. And uh, and then basically offer a bunch of the a series of uh, different uh, empirical evidence. So both is a large and and so it's as a whole my dissertation. And now I'm uh, working or turning it into a more proper book project. It's a kind of the multi method project. So I use both the large and quantitative analysis and uh, conduct a, a series of uh, small and case studies, but. Uh, in this paper particular, I'm focusing on the more is the first part is the large end uh, statistical analysis of my project. So its objective is basically to present my theory and uh, test uh, basically the external validity of my account using the, my data. So <clears throat> before uh, presenting my theory, basically I just want to illustrate is uh, how the variation can be kind of the uh, illustrating using my original data. So data <clears throat> is, sorry. So here the illustrated data are from my original data, essentially based on the collection of the policy document. And I not conducted the survey as myself, but kind of the uh, information is based on the collection of the expert view on the each country, how each country is, is uh, treated. Uh, is a, broader category of refugee and asylum seeker and so on. So the sample is basically in the, uh, in total 17 countries uh, from Africa, the Middle East, South to East Asia and Latin America. So obviously it does not necessarily cover entire world of the global South, but still has a, basically the focus. Uh, its cover is uh, most of the so-called the major refugee host country from this region. So outside, basically outside of Europe and North America. So the so original data coding data consists of seven separate sub indicator about refugees access or accessibility to a defined set of social economic rights. And the, in the final ent entry, each country within the sample had received a discrete score out of zero to four eb for every observation year from 2004 to 2016. But, but on this map, the these seven indicator for each country per year is kind of standardized and aggregated into a composite index so for specific uh, allocation methods. So if you are interested in, you can go to the appendixes I cite in the paper, but anyway, so the situation is basically is a cross-sectional variation in 2016, it's, which is the last data point of my data. But anyway, on this map is what I want to show is a country highlighted in blue is is a kind of the country that overall is a country that have a overall liberal or more passive permissive environment for refugees. And the, on the other hand, the country highlight is in red is basically the 
those country having a little bit more restrictive, comparatively restrictive uh, hosting environment for refugees. So, and using this data and explain this variation is a kind of main goal of my uh, paper. Yeah. So briefly on the theory that is central to this work. So it's basically I uh, trying to construct a similar argument that uh, with uh, uh, Martin made for the nearly 10 years ago in the context of labor migration in Europe. So the context and the background is totally different, but uh, uh, the crux of my argument is very straightforward and try to make a very conventional political economy explanation for why host country treat the refugees and also why this uh, treatment is very across country. So underlying assumption is basically every country is every country, every host country is a utility maximizer aiming to balance the cost and the benefit of the hosting refugees. So of course, all refugees may produce net benefits for uh, hosting a refugee in the medium to long term. So this is an important point, but the assumption is basically more focused on the short term impact or short term cost of hosting refugees. So and this short term cost is often said or perceived to be outweigh the benefits. So the predict outcome is more or less kind of similar to what the Martin argued in the context of the using the a framework of the number versus like trade-off. So, so as I said, so here is a basic implication is that if the number of refugees one country hosts increase, then the kind of the post entry rights they can give to refugee is decreased. So there is a trade-off is the kind of uh, my expectation. So to expand on this logic, I kind of introduced the four kind of the ideal types. So it's not necessarily the type you can uh, empirically use, but it's kind of the theoretical uh, mapping uh, based on the simple two by two matrix. So if my expectation holds is a kind of the cost benefit calculation lead to the policy design kind of the leading from the uh, number one type is to the number three type or so policy design can be kind of illustrated in the diagonal line between the number one and two number three is kind of the asymmetry relationship is kind of the key assumption of my paper. So, and, uh, but of course it's a refugee uh, hosting policy is much more complex. So this assumption number is in my frame, uh, theoretical framing number is a key predictor to assuming the quality of the lights the host country can give to refugees. But of course, this is a, one of the many factors that influence this, but uh, explaining this variation. So, <clears throat> so is there, I kind of introduced it to supplementary hypothesis to kind of the more, uh, expand on the kind of potential is the intervening logic between the number and the rights of refugee in this paper is a part one. So basically I tested the three hypothesis, proposed three hypothesis and the tested. So the hypothesis one is basically about the, a benchmark of my uh, theory. So it's basically about the trade-off between the number of uh, rights of refugees. So there will be a negative relationship between the country refugee population and the post-entry rights refugee can receive in the country. and that. I, uh, in the second hypothesis is uh, one of the supplementary hypothesis, specifically focusing on the uh, basically co-ethnic relationship between the host government and uh, its a refugee population. So my assumption is uh, if there is a uh, political relevant ethnic kinship exists between the refugee and the host government, then this kind of the negative relationship is a trade of relationship can be slightly mitigate, mitigated is a kind of basic assumption. Is a, the intuition is basically is a kind of host government kind of trying to uh, give a little bit more better treatment to the co ethnic refugees is a kind of the assumption behind uh, in this hypothesis. And uh, the second set of the uh, supreme hypothesis is more likely to the looking into the potential impacts that uh, uh, cross-border financial inflow can brought into this relationship. So whether the 
this kind of trade off can be conditioned by the host government's reliance on the foreign aid or trade revenue is a sad hypothesis I specifically tested. Yeah. So briefly on the research design, as I said, is a sample is basically constant of the semantic country across the global south. And the dependent variable is my original data is, I basically use it as a composite, so aggregate average of the refugee light index data. So created a single, one single index. And the main experimental variable is basically the refugee stock. Refugee is the number of refugee one country hosted, each country hosted relative to their national population and uh, introduce a set of the moderator. So to test us, Second hypothesis, basically, I uh, construct is uh, uh, calculate the percentage of the co-ethnic refugees uh, each country or each government hosted in this sense. So basically, this data is uh, based on the ethnic power relationship data set. So some uh, definition of the word who is a co-ethnic refugee is basically totally rely on this data set. But uh, basically, identify the first thing I did is uh, identify the uh, single ethnic group that has a predominant power in the host country and uh, uh, calculate the number of the refugees who has a co-ethnic tie between that government. So construct this data and then calculate it using uh, construct is a kind of percentage data of this one. And also uh, uh, introduce other uh, indicate a variable to explain whether the government has a predominant power in the host country's uh, politics or not. And uh, for the te tester sad hypothesis, basically I created the, uh, the variable is basically operationalized aid to GDP ratio and the trade to GDP ratio to measure the aid dependency level or a total openness level and uh, include a bunch of the uh, control variable as well. And in terms of model specification is because my interest is more about the cross national variation rather than the uh, within country variation over time. So basically I use is a random effect model. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, one uh, background is, one important background is a uh, refugee policy cannot change often time. So uh, I'm uh, using the uh, data for every year is a little bit misleading. So I kind of use it as interval data. So pick the data from the every three years is uh, in the main analysis. But uh, in the robustness checks, I try a different uh, is a interval. It's a uh, timing of the uh, data picking, but anyway. So just jump into the uh, empirical findings is uh, so first thing is uh, across thread the model, oh, it's maybe a little bit bigger, but uh, uh, throughout the empirical model, throughout the empirical findings is basically is the baseline uh, coefficient on the refugee number on the right is as, uh, is basically the negative and uh, mostly significant, statistically significant. But uh, here is basically is, uh, uh, my model includes a three-way, so-called three-way interaction. So its interpretation is pretty much uh, very complicated from the regression table, but basically the interaction effect has a, some sort of the positive effect. So it's probably difficult to understand what's going on from this table. So I just, uh, uh, <clears throat> basically the, uh, pretty the, calculate the so-called average marginal effect of this uh, average number effects of the refugee population on the post entry rights of them. So here basically is the overall is the effect is mostly negative because it's a average marginal effect is basically is a below zero in most cases. And uh, starting with a, a situation where the Host country has no dominant power, is kind of the pluralistic domestic environment. And uh, in that context, is a uh, uh, basically the effect of effect is kind of the moving to the uh, 
short summer downward shift in the means in the downside, but the situation can be changed if the host government has a kind of the dominant more authoritarian political power in host government. In that case, is the once there is a number of the coethnic refugees or share of the coethnic refugee increasing them kind of the uh Average marginal effect does not necessarily reduce according to the increasing share of the coethnic refugees. So, so there is a two different condition I can find from this uh, analysis. Is one, and the moving to the uh, second set of the regression analysis is. Uh, Again, throughout the regression model, I find is a consistent kind of the negative or main effects of the number of refugees on the right. And uh, as you see from the model five results, is a, there is no measurable effect and the sign of the question is tying to the positive, but it's basically really close to zero. So there is no uh, meaningful interpretation here. And again, in terms of the interaction effect has a uh, again, statistical significant effect, but uh, direction of the, this conditional effect is a little bit different. So again, I, I show a little bit on the average marginal effect on what's going on to show. So, <clears throat> so here is what I want to say is, uh, in terms of just starting from the uh, left-hand side graph is, Basically, the average marginal effect is kind of more severely decreased when or where the host country's aid dependency is more high. And the other side, the graph basically shows its average marginal effect is slightly kind of the move upward shift when the host country's trade dependency is a little bit increased. So interpretation is a little bit different, but the kind of the conditional effect is move, have a different impact on this uh, trade-off is uh, main one. So I'm probably going a little slightly over on time. So just jump into the key findings of this one. So is a main objective of my project is basically trying to build a theoretical and empirical foundation of comparative or cross-national analysis of regarding the design of refugee hosting policy, particularly focusing on the global science countries. So I didn't uh, spend much time on explaining about my data set, but uh, uh, introducing the new cross-national data on de facto entitlement refugee light is uh, one key uh, contribution. So before for this session, I circulated my paper and the appendix has a lot of the information about this data. So I'm happy to expand on a little bit after the Q and A session, but uh, this is one thing I did. And uh, throughout that regression model is a little bit complicated to understand, but uh, throughout the model basically is a uh, my key assumption is a number burst light prediction is more or less hold, but uh, there is certain moderating dynamics. So, so one key findings is about concerning the hypothesis two is a trade-off can be less severe when or where the host government has a political power and the co-ethnic co -ethnics make up the majority of the country refugee population. And regarding the hypothesis three, the trade-off can be also moderated or conditioned by the host government level aid or trade dependency, but this kind this moderating effect has a move, uh, work in a different direction. And of course, there are so many different uh, limitations in my work. So this limitation I'm trying to address within project and also the beyond this project. So one obvious thing is a limitation in data coding in many ways is that temporal or spatial coverage is quite limited. Also, it's a semantic uh, uh, coverage of my data is quite limited, mainly because of the availability of data. So, but I'm trying to, uh, uh, address this issue in my future, my ongoing and the future research. This is one area. And the other thing is uh, I'm slightly uh, touching on in my earlier presentation, but uh, kind of the how to incorporate the benefit of hosting refugees, particularly in the medium to long term, because my theoretical assumption is basically based on the uh, 
in in the core of the assumption is basically like a host of the hosting refugee is easily net positive. So outweigh the benefits of hosting refugee, but this is only for the short term. In the medium to longer term, refugee can make some benefit to host the country. So this is, of course, uh, important point. So how to incorporate this one to my theoretical model is another uh, point I think I need to address in the future direction. And the other, uh, the last point is mostly is, right now my uh, empirical analysis is mostly about the correlational relationship between the number and the percentage rise. So how to kind of more strong uh, causal argument between this thing, how the increasing of the number can actually reduce the quality of the rights given to the refugee or not. This is another issue. So in my dissertation work, basically I conducted the city books follow-up case studies to complement this point. But actually look into the this causal relationship is more better way or be, better way is to look into more kind of the focus on the specific country and uh, analyze more so like a within country or more subnational dimension. So this is kind of the direction I'm trying to go in the next step. But uh, thank you for attention and that it's. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting and uh, thought provoking uh, presentation. Um, I will not monopolize very much uh, the time for my own benefit as a profiting from my position of uh, chairmanship. Uh, I found particularly interesting uh, from what you have presented, this difference in the moderating effect uh, of trade and aid. I think that this can have implications for the policymakers. And I would like to hear perhaps at the end of the discussion a little bit more from you about that. Uh, I would uh, like to open now the floor for the questions. The way I propose to go about it is we take some questions first from the room, and then we take some from the online attendance, and we alternate in order to have uh, a little bit of a balance. Uh, who would like to proceed from the persons in the room? Please use your microphones. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting um, uh, paper. And um, I have uh, various questions, but I'm going to ask only one because I think there will be others who have other questions. So um, um, this is actually a more technical question, but it has, I think, theoretical implications about um, your choice for the uh, random effects model, right? And um, uh, you're saying, well, because I'm mainly interested in cross-national variation. And um, yeah, that puzzles me a bit in light of the argument that you're making about the trade-off of numbers versus rights, because the political dynamics of this seems seem to me to be very much a within-country story, right? So um, you could actually expect that there's a positive uh, association. Uh, countries that have extend a lot of rights would attract many uh, refugees, perhaps. Um, but... Um, if they have, uh, if there are many refugees, then you could also expect that there is a policy dynamic where the rights are restricted, right? Um, so if that is the case, that is um, a within country story rather than a between uh, country story. So that, um, yeah, maybe you could um, could say something about this, um, right? So the model choice in relation to your theoretical argument. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, can we take another question? We group them together from the room and then I give you the possibility to reply. Lorenzo, please. Uh, thanks, Hirotaka. Really, really good work. I'm, um, I'm a fan of indexes. Um, so maybe the part of your presentation and paper that I was most attracted to was the Refugee Rights uh, Index. Uh, and I was just wondering, I see that you have seven indicators. Uh, I was wondering whether there is a specific rationale for the choice of those. Uh, there are some important, in my opinion, indicators that you do not consider, for example, the right of association and the right of uh, naturalization for refugees. I can see that uh, my colleague and friend Jean Thomas also raised the hand earlier, and maybe that's where he wanted to, to go because I know he's working on this topic. Um, a second question, I wonder whether, so you focus on people who are recognized as refugees and, and their rights. Um, I wonder wh whether maybe there is something also for, paper, for people who are 
um, in a different legal status uh, in a country, but are not recognized as refugees. Uh, of course, important examples, Brazil, where many Venezuelans uh, uh, are displaced but uh, have decided to go down another path uh, uh, or maybe Pakistan where you know a large part of the uh, displaced community from Afghanistan uh, is uh, is not recognized as refugees uh, even though they could be entitled to and finally but feel free to cherry pick uh, my, between those um, three questions of mine still on the index uh, um, I found it um, very interesting that refugee policies and the rights uh, they change very slowly over time but you have a few cases where there seem to be important changes between 2004 and 2016 for example Turkey that becomes a lot more restrictive in your index uh, the Central African Republic uh, also becomes more restrictive and Namibia, which uh, instead becomes much more inclusive. And I wonder whether in your work you also dig into those cases and try to explain why um, refugee rights change over time and what are the drivers for, for change. Uh, again, feel free to disregard uh, some of those. So the final question is, uh, why is it that in some of the countries in your uh, in your index uh, there is a change uh, in the inclusiveness or restrictiveness uh, of rights over time? In most of the countries, there are very small changes, uh, but there are a few cases where we clearly see a, a change in direction. And uh, the question is whether you you study that as well into your work and you have an idea of what the driving causes might be. Thanks. Martin. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we've discussed this work before, so you know that I find this very interesting. But just two questions. Um, could you say a little bit more about the refugees? I mean, you use the term refugees, but I think especially also to an audience in countries where there's mainly kind of asylum seekers, I'm presuming that you, you, you well, I'm asking you who, who are the refugees. I'm presuming you're not talking about asylum seekers predominantly. You're talking about people who are admitted as refugees, and then they're being given different rights. But I don't know, maybe you could just say that. Then you use the share of refugees in the population. So, I mean, does that assume that they're all treated the same? Are you assuming that they're all, all given the same rights? I mean, you're trying to correlate the rights to a share of refugees. So, so again, who are they? Might, might some of them not have different rights? Those have been there for a longer time, for example. Um, and finally, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the rights and, and whether or not this finding is driven by very particular rights restrictions. Because you're looking at an index, right? I'm wondering whether the finding is, is driven by restrictions, very specific rights. Okay, so thank you for the excellent question. So I want to start with the first one is, uh, it's basically, I, I pretty much appreciate the point and uh, I totally agree. So it's kind of the, this is the part I'm a little bit struggling during my PhD. So it's kind of the theory is more about is suggest more about kind of the within country variation, but my interest was kind of basically started from explaining cross national variation. It's kind of the is a, I try to miss much. I kind of admit about this point. So I think it's it. This is why I mentioned it's kind of the, my focus is I'm slightly shifting it to look into the sub kind of the national variation or kind of how their specific policy change within, within a specific country. So in terms of the, it's not uh, within this paper, but it's a, it's a whole of my dissertation. I did a couple of different case studies. The one specific case is I picked the Jordan, but here is how the Jordan uh, treated is as, is as, is the majority of the Syrian refugees in the post-2011 context. And uh, kind of the, my analysis is basically a it's basically using the more qualitative side of the evidence, but the kind of the order right restriction is introduced after the Syrian refugee, so kind of the majority of Syrian refugee enter to the cross the border to the Jordan. So it's kind of the logic work in this particular context, but kind of the now what I'm trying to do is kind of trying to different data and how kind of the each governorate or each locality of the kind of the host community can kind of the react to the inflow of the Syrian refugees is particularly it's specific context of so Jordan, but kind I think its findings can be generalizable to other countries as well. And that uh, I'm pretty much uh, 
trying to look into other countries' cases as well. But this is one particular uh, element I can develop from this project, I think. And uh, uh, both uh, Lorenzo and uh, Martin's point is, uh, I think it's maybe the most, uh, Martin, the first question is related to the point uh, Lorenzo raised. So I think it's maybe it's better to clarify the definition of the refugee and the who is basically a refugee. So in this project I use is the so-called kind of the social scientific definition of refugees. So it's kind of the people is, I use the term is more kind of the blanket category of the people. So all the people basically is a, it can include the refugees, asylum seeker or people in refugee-like situation is a so-called. So basically it can kind of the mix of the, all of them. Because this is basically their data is based on the correction of the policy document. So it's easier understanding is probably is whether the, these people are treated as such by the UNHCR and the other international organization or not, because this is the main data source. It's more kind of like a text analysis. So so but it's kind of the this definition is used by other maybe leading scholar in the field, like uh, Rami Sabdrati or many, at least the political science, scientists working on the refugee and forced migration. So, but uh, the point is uh, really important because uh, whether they have proper legal status of refugee or not is, of course, it's significant impact on the individual access to refugee or not. But the uh, important point I want to highlight is, is the focus of my country is basically the global so-called developing country they do not necessarily have a proper asylum registration i mean many countries have but they do not necessarily properly implement this policy so it's kind of the under who can be the refugee who can be the asylum seeker is a little bit pretty much complicated so this could kind of the leading to some potential error and uh <clears throat> Uh, maybe my data can be um, inc incorporate some of the misleading element because of this kind of the obscure dimension caused by this one. But it's kind of the it's one of the data limitation I have. And how to address this one? It's really difficult. So kind of the so just basically the solution is basically try to make it a little bit as transparent as possible. So, I mean, in the appendix, it basically clarify what, who is, who can be the refugees and in this context and uh, who can be included in this original data is a uh, point uh, I address. But uh, beyond that, I totally ag uh, agree the point that who can be the refugee who and the with the asylum seeker and the difference between the refugee and the asylum seeker is really important. So, but in terms of my data coding, it's really hard to address this point. And in terms of their access to, I kind of forgot to the second point of their made, but uh, uh, so it's basically everything. And uh, in, in terms of the selection of the seven, uh, basically the refugee light indicator or item is, uh, it's partly theoretical kind of the deductive, but also is inductive. So first I kind of the list up the uh, lights that the majority of refugees should receive theoretically based on the in the difference of the basically the 1951 refugee convention because it's kind of the uh, benchmark of the international refugee law and the most country in practice whether they are signed or not basically refer to this convention so kind of the uh, list up the item from this convention first and then whether I can kind of the match this item into the data or information I gather from the uh, so it's kind of the iterative process from the deductive to the inductive. So, and and then so basically the final data is end up with the seven item. But so through this process, many of the item it's important to and I should have included. But reality, it's really hard to identify. So that's kind of the 
initial. And for example, is the item of the naturalization is important, but another thing is about the access to naturalization is quite limited. So only a few countries accept this concept or provide the naturalization option for the many refugees. So it's kind of the, mm -hmm. I cannot see any variation within the sample. So this is one thing why this element can be kind of the ignore in my data coding. And uh, in terms of the uh, uh, driver of the policy shift is, as I said, my data is basically limited to the specific time period from 2004 to 2016. So as Laurent pointed out, is the kind of the uh, policy change is quite rarely happen in this period. So kind of the, I identify is some policy changes, both in the direction with a positive change or negative change, but it's kind of the, in terms of the, within sample around like a policy change can happen maybe around less than 20% or something. So kind of in the, in terms of more like a static, statistical analysis, it's really hard to kind of like a rare case event. So I try to, uh, explain this aspect, but still kind of working on this one. But it's a really nice point. And uh, once I create is a more kind of the longer longitudinal data, then maybe it should be analyzed as well. But, yeah. There was a hand raised online, but I see the person is no longer there. Uh, ah, yes, yes. So please go ahead. Hello, <clears throat> thank you very much for a very exciting uh, presentation. Um, my first question is whether we can um, get, because um, in the presentation you do, it seems that you've developed a fantastic index. And uh, for those of us who are online, we, we haven't received a draft prior to the uh, talk. So it would be great if you could tell us where we can get hold of your data and uh, your coding, etc. And I'd be happy to, to give you my email address if you could make it available to me. Uh, then um, I had um, perhaps, um, so there is a question about the data, but I guess, you know, if I read your, your code book, then I would, I would understand better about what rights you have in mind, whether you distinguish between social rights, economic rights, et cetera. Um, second, uh, you, so it would be good to hear a bit more about how you build your index. Uh, Second uh, aspect, you said that you, you found you were interested in variations between social identities or between uh, nationalities, I guess. And I was wondering whether you uh, were um, finding very significant uh, differences and perhaps uh, even more significant than cross-country differences in your index if you actually look at um, the uh, legal framework uh, towards specific nationalities. And uh, my third question would be about your explanatory uh, theory, which is indeed uh, very valuable and um, rights um, versus uh, numbers uh, hypothesis. But we, we can think of a lot uh, of alternative um, hypotheses from you know, the kind of usual suspects in the uh, migration and uh, citizenship uh, scholarship. Uh, we can think of the, the significance of national traditions. We can think of the significance of the international um, um, human rights regime. And then you might want to look at the whether or not those states and when they started to become party to a um, regional or international text on a refugee rights. And uh, there is one that interests to interest me in particular, and that would be the, the political aspect. I mean, you know, you, you might expect that some countries might have a, a political incentive in being uh, kind or more generous with certain uh, refugee uh, populations. And you mentioned the example of Jordan earlier that you did a case study in Jordan. And that's a, a very, um, it seems to me a, a case in point. Um, uh, Jordan started to have a very different uh, policy towards Palestinians and introduced a much more restrictive framework uh, in 1988 when the king uh, gave up on the claim of um, reconstituting the Trench Jordan um, Kingdom. And that is basically what explains uh, the um, dramatic um, restrictions that were implemented at the time towards uh, Palestinian refugees. So basically three questions, if you could know a bit more about your data and when, where we could go to get hold of it. Uh, second, whether you find um, 
you may not find more significant variations across social identities or nationalities than across uh, countries. And third question, whether you have um, tested a rival hypotheses, which might have to do with constitutional traditions, with um, the international um, the international influence and uh, some political uh, considerations, which uh, arguably are very difficult uh, to code and to operationalize. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I do not see any other hand raised online. Yes, yes. and then there is uh, Lenka as well. Yes. On you first, Lenka. No, go ahead. Just, a, just a very quick one, really, on implications of your work. So, for another purpose, I was looking at the global compact on refugees, and uh, just made me think as you were talking because I'm not had a chance to read the paper, unfortunately. So, apologise for that, but. Would your work have any implications for the likelihood or willingness of states to engage with regional global processes or to cooperate with each other? And could your analysis accommodate uh, the, the actual engagement of states with regional or international processes? Because I think you could code for that relatively easily. And I would ex and the kind of rationale of international cooperation is that exposure to high numbers might also willing induce willingness to cooperate. I mean, that in a way that informs some of the uh, rationale for the global compact and those kind of kind of processes. So I was kind of interested in, and I, I real I know this is a cross national comparison, but it seems to me to actually potentially have some implications for international cooperation, and conceivably they could go in either direction. Uh, and it would be quite interesting, given the concentration of the refugee population in the countries that you're studying. So uh, it, it might be a future direction rather than something you can answer now, obviously. So I have a clarification question, which is a little bit technical, maybe, but I think it impacts your uh, hypothesis, too. If we could go back to the average marginal effects that you had from your model four. Because I think um, you, I don't know if you could, maybe if you put it, uh, could you put it please, sorry, yeah. So just so it's showing what I mean. Uh, yeah, I think this one, exactly. Because if I'm not mistaken, you from this, uh, you conclude that basically the, the interaction is significant and positive, but we see from the average marginal effects that basically it's just the very, it's the hundred percent, right? So and like so, and I also would be curious to know whether uh, how many cases you actually have there. You know, is this a hypothetical number or does this exist? Because I would be a little bit worrisome from looking at the average marginal effects whether this interaction is actually uh, signif really significant and positive so so and that impacts i think uh hypothesis too in, in this sense so maybe or uh, like if you could clarify this a little bit more you know this fame also this i, I assume you know this famous brambor adultery paper when they say like you always have to mention how many cases you actually have under so so i would be curious to know that Sorry, if there's just time. Um, yes, one of my questions was about um, the rights on paper and rights in practice and how you actually measured that, because that's something that, that we're doing and finding it very difficult to get very um, reliable data on rights in practice. Um, also, I, I have a little bit of problem with the term rights in practice, because often we're not talking about rights at all in, in the sense that I understand them, in the sense that people can actually claim something vis-a-vis -vis the government, um, because often what we're talking about are administrative discretions or, you know, variations on the rules. And the word right is kind of like an antithesis to that, you know. Um, so I've just wondered about um, about how you've gone about that. Um, and I had um, a thought when you were presenting, and it relates to some of the other comments about um, the range of rights that you look at. I did wonder whether there could be some interest 
if you were comparing civil and political rights and economic and social rights and how those two interrelate just in the sense of the power resources of refugees. So if you have political rights and you're politically engaged and you can organize, to what extent does that impact then on your rights? So rather than, you know, looking for more a migrant centered perspective as well. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So maybe I just want to from the technical question from the Lenka is uh, it's a is a fair point. So to be honest, I don't remember how many cases I I calculated, but in my note I don't have the number exact number, so I don't remember. But uh, uh, so as I said, it's as you say, it's kind of the uh, interval of the ninety fifty percent confidence is a bit pretty much broad. So we have to be careful about the interpretation. It's it's a main point. So and uh, uh, in terms of the more methodological aspect is is my sample is quite limited you know is the data is quite limited so it's uh, probably some uh, mistake I can potentially make in this analysis so it's, I understand but uh, I'm just saying it's kind of that this understand it's kind of really fit into the like uh, findings already there in the literature so kind of the my finding is consistent with the existing literature. So that is kind of the defense of the, my argument in that sense, I think. It's kind of more trying, it's kind of easy, it's not necessarily new, but kind of trying to kind of illustrate the existing findings in a slightly different manner and using more kind of the quantitative or systematic evidence. It's kind of the, I think it's it's an important contribution as a empirical scholar. At, at least, I think. So that is my short answer for this one. And uh, back to the question from the uh, online is, and the accessibility of the data. Yes, it's accessible, but uh, and right now I'm still kind of the, in uh, not, net, not yet published this paper. So it's if you are interested in, I'm happy to kind of the, uh, uh, give some information about this data. So just uh, please just contact me or just write an email to me and I'm happy to uh, uh, give some more information. And uh, about the uh, uh, second question is uh, uh, some analysis was uh, conducted within and uh, beyond this paper, but uh, I'm still kind of in the middle of the uh, several different modeling and so on. So and uh, I cannot give a kind of the proper finding of this aspect. So I uh, I will, I cannot kind of provide a different answer. And the alternative hypothesis is, uh, of course, there are so many alternative hypotheses. So that is why I kind of, in terms of the statistical analysis, I just include some several control variable, but uh, there can be many other factors that I have to control, but is uh, in terms of the how to do that in the statistical analysis is a little bit hard because I need the data to do that. And uh, then there are so many radical limitations to do that because even if it theoretically makes sense, but if you don't have data, then you cannot analyze. So that is kind of reality I need to, or we need to face in the actual research. So, but this one, and in terms of the uh, case of the Jordan and it's slightly back to the definition of refugee. Yes, important is that Jordan, in the Jordanian context in particular, is there, basically there are three different refugee groups. One is a Palestinian, of course, and the other is a kind of, and Arab refugees come mostly coming from nowadays Syria, but earlier is a, mostly the Iraq and the Syria is, is a Arab refugee and also is a non-Arab refugee, some from uh, mostly Sudan and uh, Yemen and some other African countries, so these uh, three group of uh, kind of refugees have a pretty much different treatment. Uh, yes, right, but uh, in the Jordanian context, basically the Palestinian, not everyone, but the majority of the Palestinian is basically the citizen. So they are kind of the not refugees. And the, they, are, they are refugees on paper, but they are not the refugees in the Jordanian, particular Jordanian context. So it's kind of is outside of focus on my specific case study, which I did not present in this 
seminar. So it's a totally different work, but, uh, and uh, so the treatment of the Arab and non-Arab refugee is very much different, but uh, in terms of the number wise, the majority of refugees coming from the Arab. So minority case is, I kind of include this one, but is a process of calculating the weighted average, maybe the focus is more on the Arab refugees. So case study is mostly focused on the how the Syrian, uh, how the Jordanian government treat the Syrian refugee, it's more kind of more specific cases. So it's not something finding can be generalizable to the treatment of the non-Arab refugee in this particular context. So that is the answer to this one. And uh, Andrew point is uh, really, I really appreciate the point, but I have not yet properly looked at the, uh, how the host country kind of the engagement with a more regional or international dynamics is something my model is like right now it's totally missing but it's an important point is it's in my sample is basically the country in the Africa and the Latin America has basically they have a more kind of regional or refugee hosting platform it's more kind of the de jure law is pretty much well developed so kind of the totally is a constitution is totally different from something region from Middle East or the South to East Asia. It's totally different. So kind of the host countries uh willingness to admit or accept incorporate this regional cooperation is kind of important aspect to look into. So in terms of the future direction, it's one way to kind of proceed. So I really appreciate that point. And and that uh, Claire's point is uh, is uh, how to measure or how to first of all how to define the rights in practice is really hard. So basically, my work is basically for the basically influence I had a huge influence. And Martin's theoretically is a multi work. I really uh, had a huge influence from that work, but also uh, uh, refer to is uh, other leading scholar of the field, like the Lamis Abdulati, she uses kind of the, uh, right now she's trying to create the so-called de facto rights of the refugees. So it's kind of the, she uses a similar definition of the rights in practices. So it's, my data is basically, my data coding is based on the, uh, is a, U.S. Committee for Refugee and the Immigrants created, used to create this uh, World Refugee Survey, and they created kind of the issue, like, like release the information about kind of the refugee light GPA or something. And uh, it's generally understood as an indicator for the de facto rights in this context. But of course, many people can disagree with whether it's, it's actually the de facto or maybe can be a digital. I don't know. But and then nowadays, is a scar in. And both is a uh, accent bed, and uh, I forgot the other author, but there is some kind of the effort, scholarly effort to create a de facto measurement for the rights of the refugees. So basically, they conducted the expert survey and the correct did that kind of the contact is so called the regional expert or country expert and did the survey and the kind of the, uh, created the indicator or index based on the survey response. But the issue of this one is kind of the transparency because who can be the country expert and uh, who can be the regional expert is kind of the slightly different and the kind of accessibility and also the coverage of the data is quite limited. So when I constructed my data, it's I trying to make it as transparent as possible and as reproducible as possible. So data was basically focusing more or less it's open source data and the correction of the policy document. That is one reason I focus on this kind of the methodology. And this one. Uh, and the second point, I sorry, I don't remember exactly what the question, but yeah. Uh, there are things, uh, several things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are several different analysis I conducted uh, after completing this project. So uh, one area I'm looking at is the so-called 
difference between the de jure and the de facto lies. So as I said, some other research team construct is the so-called the measurement of de jure refugee lies. It's in one sense, it's uh, uh, it's really kind of the very impressive work, but at the same time, there's some issue of the what what can really become the de jure refugee law, because what can be the refugee law is also a little bit controversial topic to discuss. So certain level of the subjectivity is present in any data construction effort. So how to kind of the, find the consistency and the similarity or di uh, dissimilarity between my data and the existing data is a difficult part. Uh, trying to explain the, this dimension is, it's kind of the analysis I lightly conducted right now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the time has uh, arrived to its end for the seminar. So uh, I see no other questions actually uh, from around the room. So the time has come to thank on behalf of all the participants, our speakers today for a very good presentation and very good discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>